Medical ventilators have been central to the narrative of uh, COVID-19 across the world. This is a line from a recent newspaper article. You might imagine this might be an article from a South African newspaper, but it's not. It's from the New York Times. Across the world, there is this problem that there may be a shortage of ventilators, but there's a bigger shortage of personnel to use them. This is certainly the case in South Africa. USAID, the US agency, has been importing uh, ventilators into South Africa in great numbers. The truth is these are probably being piled up in, in storerooms around the country because they are not the facilities and the staff to be able to use these things. There's been a lot of misinformation around the COVID crisis around the world. There's a lot of false news going around. And governments have been largely to blame for this. But also social media. Social media has provided a platform for instant virologists and everybody in the world has suddenly become an expert in, in the COVID crisis and all, everybody has had their opinions um, and they spread them across the social media and this has been a problem. So you, what you have is that the ventilators have become a villain. This is a, a, an honest newspaper headline. Uh, people who go into hospital, who go onto ventilators, a lot of them do die. But through social media, this has transformed into a sort of a different narrative, which says you get COVID, you go to hospital, they put you on a ventilator, and the ventilator kills you. And that's not true. So the other thing that, that social media and social platforms has brought is crowdsourcing. And crowdsourcing is great, and it can have positive and negative effects. So everybody in the world tried to build ventilators. This was something that everybody thought that they could do. They suddenly became experts, and driven by places like MIT, where students put together a ventilator based on these ambu bags. People have been watching too much television, seeing too many TV dramas, and seeing these bags being used to resuscitate patients. These bags are for emergency use only, and putting them into a mechanical device like this is, no, it looks interesting, but it's actually quite dangerous. This is not what you want to do to build ventilators like this. So looking at, at, at the COVID uh, um, disease, what does it do to your lungs? In the healthy lung, you have these alveoli, which are like, like bunches of grapes, where oxygen comes in and gets transferred into the blood and CO2 goes out. And it's very important that there's the this, this, this substance called a surfactant, which is a, uh, inside these, these, these sacs, these air sacs, which stops the lungs from collapsing and sticking together. And that allows you to breathe. You also need to have a, a, a free passage of, of, of oxygen from the air into, uh, in, in, into the blood. In a mild case of COVID, what starts happening is your own immune system and the virus attacks your alveoli, and you end up with a sticky substance inside the lungs rather than the surfactant, and your lungs tend to stick together. The alveoli tend to stick together, and also the transfer of oxygen is blocked, and this is what causes the respiratory distress that, that, uh, that, that patients feel. So what happens uh, when, when you get COVID? We, there's an unknown number of people who have COVID and have no symptoms. That's a number that's still not known in the world. But if you have symptoms, there's an 80% chance that you won't have to go to hospital. You will have mild symptoms, you stay at home, and that's good. There's a 20% chance that you have to go to hospital. Once you're in that 20% in the hospital, about three quarters of the, the, the patients who go to hospital just need very simple uh, oxygen therapy. They have very mild cases. Uh, another big chunk of, of, of patients will need some more uh, intensive uh, oxygen support, and a very small number, only about 4% of the hospitalised patients, will in fact have to go onto a full ventilator. So just looking at these different therapies, uh, this is the, the, for, the, the, for mild infections. You go in and you can go into a normal hospital ward, or you may go into the CTICC uh, field hospital in Cape Town, be put in a bed, and you either have a simple mask on your face or a nasal cannula, and after a few days of, of that therapy, you, you get up and go. At the other extreme, if you have a very severe case of COVID, you go onto, onto a medical ventilator. And that requires you to be sedated, immobilized, and it requires very, very specialized uh, services. You need to be in an ICU and you need to have ICU doctors and ICU nurses. Very expensive and a very scarce resource. But there's this interesting group of mild in, uh, infections where you don't need a full ventilator but a, a simple oxygen mask is not good enough for you. And there are two main modalities there for treating patients. One is the thing called HFNO, high flow nasal oxygen, and the other one is CPAP. And uh, we're gonna be talking here about the CPAP process. This is what was decided to be the most relevant uh, uh, modality for, for treating patients in this, this area. So what, uh, we, we've, uh, what the, the, the National Ventilator Project has done 
has run a process to have locally developed ventilators, simple ventilators, these CPAP ventilators, continuous positive airway pressure ventilators. And what these things do, they're very simple devices, and they are very intrinsically safe. They are simple to use. They use a simple mask, and they are very effective in treating the patients. So I have here an example of one of the devices that we have produced. You can see a simple mask goes onto the patient's face, and instead of a fancy ventilator, what we have instead is this very, very simple device which plugs in to a standard ho the hospital um, oxygen supply. This, this will plug into the wall or perhaps into an oxygen tank. So this was the, the, the modality that was, was decided that the National Ventilator Project would pursue. It was uh, fairly simple and also very effective. Uh, I've put only needs oxygen um, in italics in, in, uh, in the slide because this is a bigger issue. You do still need oxygen. Uh, COVID patients do need oxygen. So the National Ventilator Project, what is it? And what is Soreo, the organization that I actually work for? National Ventilator Project uh, comes out of, of, of um, the Department of um, Trade, Industry and, and, and Competition. And the idea was that was to produce locally produced South African um, ventilators which would aid in the, the, the treatment of COVID in South Africa. What is Soreo? Soreo is the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. We build radio telescopes. How is this possibly related to uh, you know, prov uh, providing ventilators uh, to, to uh, combat COVID? And the truth is that, that there's actually quite a lot of similarity between what we did to build radio telescopes and what is required to produce um, uh, ventilators in South Africa. And so uh, Soreo took on the job of basically project management of the National Ventilator Project, provided engineering services, and all the way through to the, to the manufacture and deployment of these devices. So when we got going, we, we had to go into a whole of project, uh, product development. We did this in, in collaboration with local industry. Uh, we had 90-something industries who actually put up their hand to say, we would like to help you. That was far too big a number for us to practically work with. We whittled that down to a smaller number. And interestingly, around the world, where, where this sort of work was happening, motor car industries were playing a big role, uh, particularly uh, Mercedes uh, Formula One in the UK came up with this, this uh, so-called Ventura uh, device, which we investigated ourselves. We also looked into different ways of providing the oxygen to the patients, not just a mask, but also having a full face mask or a hood. Um, and the whole advantage of a hood is that it actually would contain any exhalant from the, from the patient, so it um, basically stopped the virus from spreading. We went through a whole process of prototyping and, and testing the prototypes, qualifying them, and then finally into production. And this, of course, is where, where industry came you know, in, into, into play, doing the actual manufacture. We were very involved in the quality assurance. These are medical devices. You have to have good quality assurance. And then you build these things. You need to have uh, uh, workers who are going to put these things together in assembly and testing. And then eventually, of course, putting these things in boxes and distributing them to the hospitals. And so that was the end-to-end -end process that, that, uh, that we, as, as, as Soreo, ran. So we, there were many challenges that we had to face in producing these ventilators. And one of the biggest ones was what I call noise in the system. A lot of people, very opinionated people, trying to say, this is what you need to do. And we couldn't listen to everybody. We had to listen to only a few voices that we selected as being good voices. And we did that, and it was very similar to the process that we had to do when we built the Meerkat radio telescope. We had thousands of scientists across the world trying to tell us what to do. We had to select the, the voices that we wanted to hear so we actually could build something. So that was something we had already had experience of. And then the other one was we had to produce 20,000 devices in a very, very small, no short space of time. And of course, that was a challenge, but with uh, good project management and contract management that we had in, the, in Soreo, uh, we managed to do that, I think, OK. There were other uh, uh, challenges in the context that we worked in. And the, there were no medical manufacturing companies in South Africa. But that was mitigated very easily because of the enthusiasm of local industry to get involved. And the banner shown here, I think, really just shows the spirit of these industries. And this was, these were car manufacturing industries that we were working with. The, the big, the, of course, the big challenges was things that were happening in the public sector. Across South Africa, there was very disparate state of, of readiness and, and, and capability in the hospitals. These devices had to be deployed into the hospitals. We had to make sure that these devices could be used in any kind of hospital in South Africa. One of the big ones was there was a state of disaster. 
but there was not a really a feeling in many government departments of the fact that there was an emergency, that you actually had to you know, do something slightly different from the way you would have normally have done it, because this was now, there was now, there was an emergency on the go. And of course, silos within the government, not helped by in South Africa, where we have national and provincial uh, uh, government agencies, and particularly in the Department of Health. And this caused us a lot of stress. Um, but out of all of this and out of all these, these challenges, we got a lot of lessons from COVID. And I think there are also dividends that can, be, you know, that can come out of this. One of the, the, the clear things is we know that our infrastructures are broken in the country, particularly in the hospitals. This has really been shown up. And the oxygen supply has been a, a, a big issue. COVID patients need oxygen. Even here at Charlotte Mekeke Hospital down the road, where you know, one of the biggest uh, uh, hospitals in the country, best equipped hospitals in the country, it took us two weeks to get the oxygen supply sorted out. And you know, this, this is really, you know, was even worse in, in, the, you know, in the rural areas. There were processes in, uh, uh, happening in the country, and again, uh, funded by USAID, by, by US funders, to look into oxygen supply in, in hospitals. And this was a very successful process. This process must not stop. This must now continue into the future to make sure that our hospitals do have good oxygen supplies. The other thing we learned, I, I think, is that you don't need the fancy ventilators to treat or um, COVID patients or COVID patients. You can get by with these NVP devices. An NVP device costs on the order of $80. A full function ventilator costs $25,000. So you can see that these devices would be able to serve a large number of patients. Also, they're very simple to use, and so you don't need the, the highly skilled doctors and, and ICU staff to, to, uh, to use them. In fact, the patient themselves could almost apply this, this therapy to themselves. And so we're putting forward a proposal to the Department of Health that these devices should have a life after COVID to treat other respiratory diseases, which we know we have in South Africa. One of the things that all countries have learned is that they have to become independent or, um, su uh, suppliers themselves of medical devices. When it comes to these sorts of crises, there's a big crunch across the world, and so you have to have your own ca capacity to build um, and deploy uh, uh, things like ventilators and other medical devices. So that's one of the things that we've now started up with it within the National Ventilator Project is a capability in South Africa to produce these devices. But there needs to be some government support into this. You need incubation. You need to have some funding and make it easy for companies to make this transition into uh, building medical devices. Allow them to license these, de these, these devices for medical use. Be, have a proactive licensing rather than a reactive licensing uh, regime, which we have at the moment. And then make sure that these devices get deployed into the hospitals and they are used by patients and doctors, or used on patients by, by, by doctors in the system. Mm -hmm.